Hi. Muted. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Jordan Theory with Policy Link. Um, happy to present and kick off a webinar today um, entitled Working Across the Cradle to Career Continuum for, for Boys and Men of Color. Uh, we will um, <clears throat> start uh, right about now because we have a fully packed agenda and we want to make sure that we get to our um, amazing speakers that are going to talk about the work that they're doing here today. Um, I'll start off by just saying that the Alliance for Boys and of Color uh, is a coalition of change agents committed to improving the life chances of California's boys and men of color. Uh, the Alliance includes youth, community organizations, foundations, and leaders in government, education, public health, and uh, law enforcement. These partners work to change policies and systems at the state and local levels through organizing and advocacy. Uh, this webinar is part of a monthly series uh, for Alliance members and advocates all across the country to learn about the key issues and strategies related to improving life outcomes for boys and men of color, their families, and their larger communities. Today, our conversation will highlight on the strategies to change policy and systems um, across the, the, the cradle to career continuum. Um, and organizations that are featured here today are community rooted um, and embrace a whole person, whole family approach to transforming uh, those outcomes. Uh, we have um, three, uh, actually four amazing speakers here today. Uh, the first is uh, Maria uh, Brennan from Inner City Struggle, based in uh, East Los Angeles, um, uh, organizing around education um, issues. Uh, we also have Jose Luis Ortiz and Albino Garcia from La Plazita Institute in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, uh, doing work around juvenile justice, um, environmental health, uh, food justice, um, and education, um, as well as uh, healing and spiritual well-being work. Um, and then we have uh, Betsy Barron from Say Yes Buffalo uh, Partnership, a collective impact model, um, cradle to career changing uh, the way Buffalo Public Schools um, serves uh, the educational needs of, of students and their families. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with our first speaker. Uh, Maria, take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, what I wanted to do was um, begin by describing um, our organization briefly. Inner City Struggle, as was mentioned, is based in the east side of Los Angeles. And uh, we were started in 1994 um, by a group of parents, youth, and residents uh, concerned with the lack of opportunity for young people in the East Side community. And we uh, focused for the last um, several years on educational justice organizing to build a voice and power for those that have the most at stake when it comes to educational opportunity and upward mobility. And if we could see the next slide, please. One of our added strategies in the work that we do is also engaging uh, voters, young voters, new and occasional voters to mobilize and have a voice in their community. Uh, we can see the rest of the slide. Thank you. A key component of our work uh, includes coalition and alliance building for school change and other community change. Because in order to change social conditions, we need to build a broad-based movement. We can see the next slide, please. Before I describe in detail our model, what was key for us was examining uh, the conditions in our schools. And the catalyst for our work in organizing youth and families over the last several years was in response to the dire conditions that we saw. For example, um, 
over 15 years ago, there existed only four high school campuses for over 16,000 students. Only 40% of students were graduating. Only one out of 12 were college eligible. In some of our schools, we witnessed over 600 annual suspensions. There were very few supports and services available at our local high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. And what we saw was a high enrollment of students in JRTC programs, military programs. Our schools uh, continue to be majority low-income Latino, um, and many are uh, from immigrant families. And so what the examination of these conditions told us is there was low expectations for Latino students, and students were disappearing from our schools and being tracked into the military, low-wage labor, and the school-to-jail pipeline. So these dire conditions became the catalyst for building power and advancing educational justice and taking on campaigns to disrupt the lack of opportunities and disrupt the fact that our schools were centers of failure. We can see the next slide. So over a decade, by building the leadership of young people, uh, building intergenerational coalitions with families and parents, we have been able to secure significant campaign wins uh, from building new schools for our community, making college access mandatory for all, uh, improving facilities, ensuring that there, there is access to nutritious food in the classroom, eliminating punitive discipline, ensuring the construction of wellness centers to provide comprehensive health services, securing more funding for the highest need schools in our communities, and winning a long-term commitment by our school board to ensure every child is prepared for college and that there are high expectations in place. So I will get back to what the overall impact has been um, in terms of securing these wins and the goal being transforming our schools from centers of failure to centers of opportunity. But in order to have taken on uh, these fights, we had to build a foundation for organizing, for building power, and engaging those who have the most at stake, particularly young people. So if we could see the next slide. So in our work, we're very clear that there is a science to organizing and developing leadership. And this uh, slide provides a snapshot of our model. So on the left, um, we begin with our universe of the student population at all the schools that we are organizing in. Um, there are six high schools uh, in the east side in which our organizing is anchored uh, in terms of youth organizing. Um, two of these schools that are now here, Torres High School and Mendes High School, they were constructed as a result of our campaign uh, over 10 years ago, our campaign win. From the left, we moved to, our, uh, to the right, and that's a base of students, um, 250 to 500 per campus. And young people themselves are equipped with the skills and the analysis to sign up supporters for uh, our agenda, educational justice, disrupting the school to jail pipeline, increasing expectations, and students are engaged through lunchtime outreach, classroom presentations, um, educational workshops, what the young people that we work with called educational justice weeks, 
which involve trainings, workshops, lunchtime activities, um, using tools like t-shirts and buttons to engage young people and expose them to the issues. From there, there's further opportunities for deeper, deeper involvement that are created. We have a general membership structure with 40 to 60 um, students per campus um, that are involved and participate in weekly meetings on campus. They're exposed to political education, analyzing the issues of the day, uh, looking at what are the concerns at their schools that they want to address, and building leadership skills, like public speaking, um, base building, outreach, and negotiating with other decision makers um, to have their demands be heard. Then there is further um, opportunity for uh, involvement and leadership development. So we have a pathway of core leaders that um, have a deeper level of involvement that get uh, connected through the coordinating committee that also meets uh, on a regular ba basis weekly at our headquarters. All the east side leadership um, from the high schools comes together. There are 10 to 15 general members represented um, and they uh, engage in deeper campaign organizing strategy, receiving holistic leadership development, uh, they also are able to obtain academic services advising, which is a key component of retention of this group that is highly involved. And they also uh, receive um, political education, analyzing all the different interlocking systems of oppression and how they impact institutions, interpersonal relations, and how each of us internalizes. Uh, those oppressions and how we can challenge them at all those levels. So that's our that's our model for how we've been able to effectively engage young people over this long term period and involve the next generation and the next generation of students to build power and advance educational justice. We can go to the next slide. Uh, briefly, I want to give one specific example of how young people took on an issue that they identified at their school and were able to move a successful campaign. And this specifically had to do with disrupting the school to jail pipeline in looking at the high suspensions and punitive discipline measures that impacted schools on the east side with the goal of not just challenging the problem, but also proposing a alternative vision um, to create an empowering school environment that refrains from using zero tolerance policies and instead uses a restorative justice approach. We can see the next slide. So one of the key foundations to a campaign is to investigate uh, among your base, in this case students, to identify what are their concerns, what are they impacted by, and what in terms of an issue would resonate with the largest amount of, of the base. So the, in 2002, 2003, we conducted a survey with thousands of Eastside students and these were some of the key issues that emerge. And the way in which this was summarized uh, by the young leadership um, of inner city struggle once all the findings were put together, all the qualitative and quantitative findings, was that the top three problems faced by Latino students in the east side of Los Angeles was criminalization within the school environment that there were low expectations uh, inherent in the schools because of lack of opportunity and uh, a high use 
of punitive discipline and that this um, deterred students and were deep barriers for mobility into higher education because so many students um, responded that their goal was a college education. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, the slide that you're about to see was uh, put together by um, a research institute in UCLA, UCLA IDEA, and um, it maps out where Latino and African American residents live. So in the darker uh, shaded areas, there's um, up to 100% of African American and Latino residents. In the lighter shaded areas, there is as low as 0 to 20 percent um, African American and Latino residents. So you can see that, for example, at uh, Roosevelt High School in the middle, that's one of the schools that we organize in, in the heart of the East Side in Boyle Heights, out of 100 uh, freshmen, um, in the year, uh, out of 100 freshmen that came in in the year 2000, um, only 35 graduated and only 16 were eligible for college. And this is a school at this time of about 5,000 students. So you can see that the outcomes are very low in academically. Um, you'll see a school like San Marino High, which is in a very affluent uh, neighborhood to the right um, of the county of LA. This school, out of 100 of their freshmen, 95 graduated and 78 were eligible for college. And I'm going to ask um, to click in all the numbers. So what you're about to see in terms of numbers um, you can uh, click to the next piece, is the suspension rates, the annual suspension rates of these schools for this year in which um, these students, these groups of, of interim freshmen graduated four years later. So you can see a school like San Marino High, only 78 students were suspended. You start seeing our schools much larger numbers. Roosevelt High School had one of the worst rates, over 900 suspensions. And when we talk to students, when the young leaders talk to students, um, you know, at this time it was anecdotal, but the majority of suspension were for minor offenses or what was termed willful defiance. So there was, this was a huge issue that we needed to address. Next slide, please. So at Roosevelt High School, students um, decided they were going to promote and fight for restorative justice. And we recognize that this was a major problem based on the data and based on the feedback of students. And students themselves, um, there was a group of 800 that were surveyed and organized and they set the priorities for themselves of what type of behavior expectations they would want to see at Roosevelt High School. And this is a key component of restorative justice, student ownership, student involvement, so they took their school mascot um, and created an acronym. They're the Roosevelt Writers. Respect, intelligence, dignity, empowerment, resilience, and support. And through this group of 800 students and engagement of decision makers and conducting town halls, they were able to secure a commitment to eliminate punitive discipline and instead have the writer's uh, behavioral expectations be the driving force for discipline at Roosevelt High School. And we have seen dramatic decreases in suspension since then. So if we go to the next slide, this um, 
local campaign at this high school that faced um, extreme um, an extreme problem in over suspension of students of color laid the groundwork for us to be ready to engage at a district-wide county level. And in 2012, Inner City Struggle joined the Brothers Themselves Coalition focused on addressing uh, the disparities faced by young um, boys and men of color. And one of the first steps that the coalition took was demanding access to the data that did not exist in terms of race and discipline. So if we could go to the next slide. So this um, data point was very significant. Finding out that in the year of 2013, 2014, in the midst of our campaign, black students in the Los Angeles Unified School District were almost six times more likely than white students to get ticketed and arrested by school police. So this was a significant data point in the formation of our district-wide campaign. Uh, I have one more data point to show um, that illustrates the problem in terms of race and discipline. We can go to the next slide. So as we had learned in our own community that there was a overuse of willful defiance as a reason to suspend students, and willful defiance is a very broad category. It could include talking back to a teacher, not bringing the right materials to class, uh, violating dress code, and, and these were things we heard on the ground. Um, being used as reasons for suspending students. And you can see disproportionately in terms of race and the impact to Latinos and in particular African American students. Um, it was, you know, an issue that we had experienced on the ground. And then now we had through our organizing and working together in coalition, now we had the district data to substantiate the experiences of young people. So over a two-year campaign in fighting what we uh, titled the School Climate Bill of Rights, uh, organizing young people, engaging the media, negotiating with decision makers, and mobilizing to the school board, we won a major reform in 2013, if we could see the next slide. Uh, this was championed by allies, at, two allies at the school board, three allies at the school board out of seven. And the passage of the Bill of Rights ended willful defiant suspense, suspensions, which impacted youth of color at higher rates. It secured the implementation of restorative justice programs district-wide. District and this new policy, um, also redefined and limited the role of school police in school discipline. But the end of willful defiance was major and it became, the district became the first in the nation to make such a move. I have um, two more slides. And this win would not have happened if young people were not at the front in terms of expressing their experiences, having an analysis, connecting their experience to data, and being able to mobilize hundreds more to shift the debate. You know, one of their um, mottos was every student matters, and we need to support students, not punish them. And it was uh, really, that was really the fight, changing the narrative. And through the organizing, we were able to do that and win the votes we needed to pass the School Climate and Builder Rights. So if we could see the next slide, um, a critical component to our work to maintaining the involvement of high need youth from our communities is providing academic services. Our students do not have access to uh, their guidance counselor at their school. So for us, being able to provide this is critical to our organizing strategy, to our retention of leaders, 
and making sure that our students are set up for success once they move on from the program and uh, graduate from high school successfully. So over uh, the next slide, over um, a decade, you know, our effort in engaging young people, organizing, building power, building coalitions, in the east side we have seen a significant shift in terms of the outcomes and the data. You know, it, the class of 2005, only 44% of students in all our high schools had graduated. Uh, 11 years later, 83 graduated with their college preparatory requirements in place. So there's a lot more work to do because we believe in 100%. Um, but this shows that organizing, uh, taking on the status quo, challenging institutional racism through those, the voices of those that have the most at stake is, um, is effective. So if we could see the next slide. That concludes my presentation, and I believe we're taking questions at the end. And uh, my contact information is here if anyone would like to reach out directly. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, fantastic uh, presentation. And I'll just add that, uh, you know, due to the success of the LA campaign to end willful defiant suspensions, um, that's a policy that the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color uh, is trying to take uh, statewide um, this year through, through the legislature. Um, let's uh, move on to um, Albino uh, Garcia and Jose Luis Ortiz from uh, La Plazita Institute in, in New Mexico. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Albino. And this is Jose Luis. Um, so welcome to uh, virtual Burke Albuquerque. Arale. So uh, we're going to give a little snapshot of some of our work here, um, a little lay of the land here. Um, the the uh, state of New Mexico, we have 22 Native American reservations and um, over 50 different tribal affiliations that we serve uh, annually um, that live here in, in Albuquerque. Um, and we are majority uh, Chicano, Latino, Hispano, um, uh, population. We live in the South Valley of Albuquerque and uh, um, we uh, um, live in an area in the zip code 87105 and 87121. They make up the South Valley. We have the highest um, dedicated number of probation and parole officers in the state um, in our area. We have the highest rate of uh, participation in the criminal justice system for youth and adults, the highest number of adjudicated uh, um, youth as well, male and female, uh, people of color. And uh, we have all the other disparities as well. It sounds kind of doom and gloom, but uh, it is what it is, right? And um, we have the highest, some of the highest dropout rates, health disparities, etc. cetera. Um, on the other hand, um, one of our, our strengths, I think, is, is uh, taking some of that, uh, uh, you know, challenge um, demographics um, and chalking it up to experience and, um, and barrio capacity, so to speak. So um, as a result um, of that, we, you know, we're able to um, start to break down some of the institutional uh, structural racism and address it little by little. Um, it's taken many, many years. Um, but one example is that our county, Bernalillo County, was uh, designated by the Annie Casey Foundation, the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative, JDAI, as a model site. And so many years ago, um, the technical consultants came in um, and informed uh, this model site that they were somewhat out of compliance. Um, and part of the uh, reason for that was that they had um, brought numbers down in our juvenile justice system from 150 beds daily uh, by 100 beds. They removed 100 beds, so the average was about 50 on a daily basis. 
of incarcerated kids in our county. Um, and they were getting kudos for that. But uh, little uh, work was being done as far as reducing racial disparities. Um, and so uh, at that time I was asked to come to the table and um, I walk in a room with, you know, the prosecutors and the, the judges, um, uh, probation and the detention uh, uh, correction staff and was asked to participate as a community member. And um, so in doing that, I invited them to come into our neighborhood, the neighborhood which held the greatest participation in the criminal justice system on every level. And by doing that, um, you know, we, we invited them uh, uh, in our way to the people's court. And so when they came down, they decided that, um, you know, this was going to be the form that we were going to try to work on. Now, for years, we started to break down some of the barriers, assumptions, prejudices, stereotypes of working with people of color. Although they brought the numbers down by 100 beds, those 50 beds were almost exclusively, you know, people of color, children of color. And that goes for the adults. We also have the highest rate of incarcerated mothers and fathers, also people of color. So it's not it's a it's a multi generation uh, need that we have here. Our approach, as you know, many of you who have been in the movement long enough, you know, you've heard the term la cultura cura, which translates to culture heals. So we believe, you know, in, in our approaches, our philosophy, that culture is one of it truly um, our greatest intervention, our greatest you know medicine, and if we can. Um, provide a true sense of identity, cultural identity, a cultural sense of belonging, and a cultural sense of ownership um, within our people, um, that that's the first real step uh, um, that we need to take in order to replace some of those, uh, you know, identities that have been imposed on them, um, you know, through, you know, for whatever reason, oppression, and et cetera. So, um, so all the way down to our youth, we use the characteristics of culture in, in all of our activities. Um, traditions, rituals, ceremonies, symbolism, languages, rites of passage, naming ceremonies, etc. And not just with the children, um, but with families and members of and, and other members generationally in the community who have been somewhat removed from being proud or having that sense um, of true traditional culture and identity. So um, we have a couple slides here that we're going to kind of run through real quick. Uh, and these are some of the approaches um, that we um, are now being, you know, uh, asked to talk about a little bit because it is out of the box uh, a bit. Let me just also in my initial introduction with um, that throughout the you know the time of you know trying to create a relationship with the criminal justice system, its representatives, divisions, departments, um, etc., and we had some really tremendous uh, uh, clashes, um, and a lot of it was very frankly straight up racism. And you know my organization is made up seventy five percent of people who have. Uh, you know, struggled in life, and my, yours truly included, been incarcerated, um, you know, a lot of us, you know, addicted to drugs, uh, been a part of the, you know, society's ills, but we've come out the other end, and, you know, thank God that, you know, uh, that, that serves as a lot of our credentials. So there's a lot to say about that. Our credentials, our licenses, our certifications, you know, come from life experience, and it is truly um, a very dedicated population um, that serves our community as a result. So um, it also comes with biases and prejudices and assumptions by the system. Oh, these are people, they're all tattooed, they're ex-cons, they're this, they're that, previously incarcerated, you know, ex-drug addicts, you know. Um, there's an assumption that we have less morals, less ethics, less, less you, know, ed, you know, dignity. And um, and we had to you know we had to work with that and that was our initial barriers. As a result, we have to own our own shit, so to speak. Too, I don't know if that's allowed, but 
Um, um, we have to own our own stuff. Um, you know, we, we look at the system as the enemy. And if, and if we're going to do our work um, with, you know, and for boys and men of color, children of color, families of color, um, we have to transcend our trauma, our generational trauma, our historical trauma, our current systems oppression trauma. And if we don't transcend it, then that we're operating out of that. And as a result, um, you know, our work is skewed. So in order to be authentic, truly, truly congruent, with the teachings of our cultural, you know, ancestors, etc., we need to heal and transcend that, and then treat our enemy, believe it or not, as our family. Um, that's the approach we take with our systems, folks. Specifically, here's how we do it. I'm going to turn it over to Jose Luis. <coughs> so I want to go to the next slide. Um, you can see here, this is uh, our impact model here at La Placita, how we engage our youth in first um, self-discovery, self uh, self-transformation, uh, moving into uh, family wellness, um, uh, engagement, family events and relationship support, then moving into community engagement, community events, and then institutional engagement, navigating schools, courts, jobs, uh, jails, prisons, and all sorts of different institutions out there that as, as, um, as we're, we're faced to be healthy uh, community members, we have to know how to in, engage on those levels. Um, and, you know, taking a look at our own personal development and self, and self transformation, connecting back to our co co core cultures, understanding not, not who we are and not who we have been for the last 80 or 100 years, rather looking at who we've been for the last thousand years as it pertains to our, our land-based cultures and our land-based ways of living and knowing, um, <clears throat> how, we, how we heal ourselves, how we connect with um, the community to, to heal ourselves and the community. And we take those, those things and apply them in a real-life way. Uh, we have um, our traditional healing programs. Go ahead and hit the next slide. And looking, so you know, as he goes on, I just wanted to inject something that that impact model and the logic uh, model key that you're seeing right now. Um, props where props is due, Jordan. Um, we want to thank you because this was the work that we did together um, during the under construction series, and uh, Jordan helped us design this whole uh, these last two slides. So. Uh, Thanks, Jordan. All right, next slide. Yeah, thank you. So if you take a look here, this is our La Placita Gardens. This is uh, two and a half acres of mix, mixed vegetable farms. What this really is is an agroecological learning center. Uh, we're able to take youth who have spent most of their childhood on the streets, um, you know, running with, with gangs, struggling through life in urban city areas, or even on the reservation away from their agricultural upbringing, and put them right into the land, doing, doing what they have done for thousands of years. So we always say here is there's nothing that we're teaching you, we're simply helping you remember who you are and remember who you are supposed to be. And the farm has become a therapeutic healing space um, for our youth and for you know our intergenerational community. And beyond that, it's also become a place of skills learning, uh, taking these very knowledgeable land-based skills to be applied to their future uh, development um, so that they could generate resource and money to support themselves and their families. Um, go ahead and hit the next slide. So, you know, this is sort of a breakdown of, of what our, our gardens represents and, and what we get into. We have a 40 family CSA uh, where members are able to donate to our program to give to families in need for a tax write-off. Uh, we're a certified organic farm in the South Valley. Uh, we run year-round food production out of three hoop houses and an acre and a half of purple asparagus. Um, and really what the program is intended to do is to provide financial support to uh, the institute's programs that, that can be funded or that um, won't be funded. So we're able to serve those very uh, critical components of the organization's uh, program and development. 
and um, in, a, in a few minutes you're going to hear a little bit about uh, our organization was uh, recently uh, designated in, last month in January. Um, as a result of the JDI work we did with our county, with our law enforcement and, and uh, judicial and criminal justice system, um, um, we're dealing with bringing the, the number, uh, you know, the racial disparity by taking um, alternatives to detention programming out of the system and in the community. So what that means is that La Placita Institute, as of January 1st, became um, the alternative detention program for our county juvenile justice system. So on a daily basis, um, kids have a choice. There's a 30-day program called the Youth Reporting Center, YRC, and GRC, Girls Reporting Center. It's a 30-day observation program. They can come out and be released from detention and work on our garden program, um, get acu detox, go through sweat lodge, do various kinds of things and um, in lieu of being locked up. So then they get freedom in the evening and on the weekends. And as long as they don't have dirty dirty tests, urinalysis tests, and, and they don't, you know, abscond, you know, go on the run or anything like that, and they participate in our program daily, they're free. They're, they're not locked up. So that, that photo that you see right there, that's a three-foot bed of mixed salad that's um, certified organic. From this end, from the bottom of the photo to the mid, uh, midway all the way down to the other side of the coal freight, if we were to cut that whole, uh, that whole row, it would probably be about 100 to 120 pounds of, um, of salad. Well, we, we sell it retail for $9 a pound because it's certified organic, but we sell it wholesale for $5 a pound to, kid, uh, to the kitchen at the youth detention center currently. And so kids who are currently detained and locked up in their kitchen, they're serving our food that the kids who are now released um, are helping uh, cultivate, harvest, seed, weed, everything like that. And the county has an exclusive contract with us now. Uh, so we would sell a whole row of that at 100 pounds that we can get one cut off um, at an average of $5 a pound wholesale. Well, you can put the numbers together. You can see that. Um, and then the next, the next uh, week, we'll cut the second row. And then the next week, the third row. And then we come back, and we can get three or four cuts from each row. So we're talking about anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500 you know, per row, per seating. It's pretty, pretty uh, good way to make your own money. And also, hey, you hey, know. Albino, you, you guys got two, two minutes. You got to wrap. Thanks. Okay, so our farm also serves, we, we work with very young youth to show them um, these skills so they're able to, you know, get involved in their cultural activities. Go ahead and click the next slide. So we have various other uh, programs that helps to support the organization, silk screen design, um, ceramic therapy, which are also designed to teach a skill uh, to young folks and older folks um, so that they can learn how to sustain their own lives. Next slide, please. Keep it going. Go ahead. So this is what Albino was talking about earlier, our Youth Reporting Center. We now work in partnership and collaboration with the county. We're a non-traditional leadership institute. Um, we have a Barrio Youth Corps and an Urban Native Youth Corps. We're proud to be the nation's first urban. We partner with federal U.S. Department of Agricultural Agriculture sites uh, to state state refuges, federal refuges, non-governmental organizations like conservation corps, etc., to provide access to opportunities and skills building for our previously incarcerated youth. We also challenge them to transcend, um, you know, their their requirements to allow folks to be in 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 these positions, uh, because first and foremost, they're limited. Uh, whether they're ex-cons or what we call uh, returning citizens, they may not uh, traditionally be allowed in those spaces. We bend that program to allow them access to um, get those skills. Next slide, please.
So this is some of our Urban Native Youth Corps members in our farm. Go ahead, next slide. Again. One more time. So we have a Making a Change program, and what our Making a Change program really does is it engages youth, um, men, women, and community members to, to come together and share stories and experiences. Uh, we have uh, been there, done that, members of our organization that are, that are mentors, and it's really about providing a safe space for, for folks to talk what's going on in the community, what's going on in their lives, so that they don't feel like they're the only ones going through the struggle. Next slide. Next one. Go ahead. Next one. Go go ahead and keep it going. One more. So uh, tonight uh, is Tuesday, uh, and we're having a, a meeting this evening, um, specifically addressing our racial disparity issues. So our judges and our prosecutors and the probation and detention folk, along with some of our community leaders and all our families and youth and their parents will be meeting tonight. Um, you can't smell over the uh, phone line right here, but uh, the staff is cooking up a storm. We're having, ta uh, we're having tacos, uh, arroz and frijoles, uh, and the whole, whole place here is smelling uh, really, really good. So we feed our people, we're bringing them together, we're going to break bread, and then we're going to talk about how we can, you know, you know, together uh, reduce racial disparities amongst uh, our, uh, our youth of color. And that's our uh, Parents Making a Change program. And just to close it out, some of the other important things that we do on the, on the next slides over, uh, we do pathway system navigation um, services. What's really important to know is a lot of our people can't succeed simply because they don't know how to navigate the systems, whether that's health care, um, home care, uh, education, um, and all the various institutions and spaces we have to navigate to become healthy, productive uh, um, members of society, we help to navigate that space for them. We find that very successful with our uh, our inmate populations. When they come out, we're able to get them into school and provide them education um, to eventually provide them uh, safe living spaces and whatnot. Um, part of our traditional healing services, we uh, we provide traditional healing uh, with you know one to focus focus healing in a traditional way. Um, with curanderismo, with uh, sweat lodge, and, and acu detox. These are proven methods that, that help with um, everything from stress, anxiety, uh, to the urge to wanting to use. And these are all services that we offer for free to the community. We have a, a, a very large in-kind service that we offer to um, the surrounding community here, here in Albuquerque, which is a, get one, it's a great way to give back, but it's also a, a proven way to help heal people. And uh, with that, we just want to say thank you. Visit our website um, on, and on Facebook. We could go on for a long time about the work that we do here at La Placita, um, but come pay us a visit. Out of all the people um, present on this phone call, you all are welcome to come and break bread with us, share with us, and see the work that we do. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jose Lu uh, Luis and uh, Albino. Sorry to, to cut you guys short. Uh, you know, so much to hear about, and we should organize a site visit down to Albuquerque and, and to East LA to, to delve deeper into the work that's been presented thus far. Uh, let me turn to uh, Betsy from SAYUS Education Buffalo so we can hear about the work happening out on the East Coast. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. First, I'm just going to talk real quickly about uh, what the situation is here in Buffalo. We, unlike uh, the other two presenters, we're more of a relatively new partnership in our community. We started our work in 2012, and uh, so we're only about five years old. But when we started, um, we were dealing with the, the challenges that go along with being the third poorest city in the United States. We're also very segregated. We had had many, many years of only a 50% high school graduation rate from our public schools. For young men of color, that rate was about 20%. Only about 24% of our population had a college degree. And on the employer side, we were hearing that 
Um, there was there was jobs that needed filling, but the local workforce uh, wasn't equipped with the necessary skills. So if you can go to the next slide. So what we did is we put together uh, really a, a community-wide partnership that brings together anyone and everyone who has a stake in public education, and that includes government, higher education, uh, union, labor, business, of course the K through 12 public system, parents, um, faith leaders, and anyone else you can think of. Uh, the the key parts of our effort are a tuition scholarship. We offer a promise scholarship. So that is if you graduate from one of our Buffalo public or charter high schools, we will pay your tuition at a uh, New York State public college, community college, university, etc. So that's a big carrot. And then we also coordinated comprehensive support in the K-12 pipeline to provide those services that our families, students and families living in poverty really need so that they can make their way to high school, graduate high school, ready to, to get to college. Ultimately, this is an economic revitalization strategy and that's how we're able to engage philanthropy and the business community. But what we're really doing every day is working one-to-one -one with students and families to address any barriers uh, to their education. So if you want to go to the next slide, you can see the specific programs that we put in place. And I think it's important to note that SAS Buffalo is really sees itself as a convener. We don't actually, uh, with some exceptions, provide a lot of these programs. We more bring people together and help people um, get their programs out to more people, strengthen the collaborations so that the benefit for everyone is, is more realized. And uh, a couple of interesting ones, and I think when you think about what systems change looks like, for us it looks like bringing services to people and families as opposed to having them have to search them out um, themselves in different parts of the community. So what we've done is we've embedded after school programs in the school buildings. We have embedded college and financial aid um, supports in the school buildings. Social services is directly available in the school buildings, um, as well as legal services. We have mental health clinics in all 55 of our K through 12 public schools. We have a mentoring and an internship program for our college kids. And like I said, we offer a pretty substantial college scholarship program that's open to every student in the school district. Um, if you want to um, go to the next slide, I think the other important thing to think about for us with systems change is that we uh, really think of our collaborative governance, and that really is everyone at the table as our secret sauce. Um, we have two governing bodies. One is our community leadership council, and that includes the mayor, the deputy county executive, um, the New York State Regent, and the president of our Board of Education. They meet six times a year, and they really guide from a big picture point of view the direction of this partnership and then help address any challenges that might arise. And then we also have a operating committee that meets three times a week, and at that you've got the head of the union, You've got the head of our largest foundations, presidents of our largest universities, um, parents, the school district, and they really meet to sort of set that day-to-day -day operational goals and uh, address challenges along the way. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, we've had some really exciting early results. I noted that we had a 50% graduation rate for many years before we started our work. In 2012, it was 49%, and we just found out that last year's graduating class was at 64%. So we've climbed 15 percentage points, which we're really excited about. Obviously, still more work to be done, but moving in the right direction. Um, same thing with the matriculation rate. We've seen a jump of about 10 percentage points, hoping to get um, a further jump when we get the numbers through 2016 in a couple days. And uh, the persistent rates from which we've seen, we've only had one class that we've been able to track, but it looks like they're sticking as well. I think if you want to go to the next slide, what we're really excited about and a, a place that we're going to be doing more and more work as we move forward is really to close the opportunity gap specifically among our young men and women of color. We are a school district that is 20% white and 80% 
um, Hispanic, Latino, uh, Black, African American, and Asian. So we have, and you can see here on this slide, sort of the graduation rate um, from 2012 and up to 2015, how we've increased for the men and women of each of those different groups. Um, and we've seen some really great jumps for the young people of color, and I think that's an area that we want to continue working. Um, so that wraps it up for me. I <laughs> tried, to, <laughs> tried to go pretty quick. Um, we're a pretty comprehensive partnership, um, so if anybody has questions about anything specific to what we do, uh, please ask them now or visit our website or give us a call. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. Uh, appreciate your your brevity <laughs> um, <laughs> and your responsiveness to, to the time situation, but um, I think that was a really great overview. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, we haven't uh, received any questions uh, in the uh, question chat box um, that I can see. Correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong, Jen. Um, but what I would like to do is, um, if it's okay with the speakers, um, provide your email address um, in the follow-up email that will go to the those just those who have participated in the webinar today. In case people do have follow-up questions, uh, since we don't have um, much time for discussion, is that all right? Of course. Great. And um, <clears throat> this webinar will also be available. The recording will be available online on the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color website uh, within a week. And so we'll make sure to let you know uh, when it is available online. And you can uh, uh, listen to it again if you if you enjoyed it so much. But um, definitely share it with your colleagues if you feel like it's something that um, they could benefit from as well. Um, with that, I just want to uh, take the time to thank our speakers, um, really powerful group of community uh, change agents here coming from uh, different uh, perspectives, strategies, um, and I think it highlighted just the, uh, the broad spectrum of uh, what is available to deploy policy and systems change work in uh, communities at the local level. So um, Maria, Albino, Jose Luis, and Betsy, thank you all so much. Uh, for your presentation, for your time, and, and for the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, please continue to uh, uh, keep it up, and uh, we will continue to track and uh, see how we can be supported from the Alliance for Boys and the Color um, perspective. Thank you all for joining the webinar today. Um, have a great rest of your day, and we hope you will join the March um, webinar, uh, which will be on March 21st as well. Uh, actually, March 22nd, so you'll be getting an email about that in the follow-up as well. Uh, thank you and have a great day. Thanks.